After the death of Socrates and the breakup of Greek culture that resulted from the Peloponnesian War, Socratic philosophy went into a decline and fragmented into several pieces. And the fragments of Socratic philosophy make up the body of Hellenistic philosophy. What I mean by Hellenistic philosophy is the subsequent developments of Greek philosophy, which take their cue from the Socratic approach to philosophy. Yet, they don't have all the component parts of Socratic philosophy. They usually lack, lack the wit. They almost always lack the poetry. Occasionally, they absorb some of the ethical doctrines or epistemological doctrines. But the ones who come after Socrates never really live up to the Socratic ideal. The three main fragments that Socratic philosophy breaks into are called Stoicism, Epicureanism, and Skepticism. And these are the most important Hellenistic outgrowths from Socratic philosophy. And since Rome, the Roman Empire in particular, is the political entity which ultimately dominates the Mediterranean basin and absorbs and inherits the tradition of Greek philosophy, most of the, Hellen the Hellenistic branches of philosophy are developed in connection or with reference to either politically or intellectually with Roman culture. And the first of these developments is hedonism or Epicureanism, named after a guy named Epicurus. And what Epicureanism says is that pleasure is the only good and that the happy man is the one that has a great many pleasures, but no corresponding pains. And there is potentially a way of deriving that from Socratic philosophy. If you would take the idea of Socratic prudence, the man who drinks a little bit in order to get a certain degree of pleasure, but then no, not so much as he will cause himself a hangover or cause himself some corresponding pain, he's being prudently Socratic, picking and choosing his pleasures in such a way that he does not generate any corresponding pains. A second alternative, again a minor alternative, fragment of Socratic philosophy is called skepticism. Socrates throughout most of the dialogues, I would, hesitate, I would emphasize the word most rather than all, says that he doesn't know anything. Part of the Socratic irony is this posture of acting as if he's really an ignorant man when in fact he is wise, in saying that he knows nothing and thus never trying to teach people by directly making declarative sentences. For the most part, Socrates teaches by question and answer. Socrates helps people to articulate and to realize what's already buried within their soul. When Socrates does that, when he's in that skeptical mode, he says, I myself know nothing. All I do is inquire into things. I'm the eternal acquirer. I'm the patron saint of rational inquiry. And it's possible to see, particularly within the context of the Roman Empire, how skepticism might develop from that Socratic stance of knowing nothing. Remember that the Roman Empire is a heterogeneous mix of peoples and cultures and religions and philosophical positions. And after being forced to encounter one cosmogonic myth after another, one theory of religion after another, one theory of morals after another, sophisticated Romans, sophisticated Hellenistic thinkers might well come to the conclusion that Lucian the skeptic did, which is that no one really knows the right path. No one even knows if there is a right path. The best we can do is say that the pretensions made by the various schools of philosophy are just that, pretensions. Skepticism, while it may be rather negative, is at least right. We can be certain about what we do not know. Right. And it's possible to see how someone, especially someone that was terribly frustrated with the attempt to obtain final, absolute knowledge, might resort to skepticism as a kind of easy way out, a way of avoiding the burden of Socratic inquiry. The third and most important development in Hellenistic philosophy is called Stoicism. And Stoicism is probably the greatest and most interesting achievement of the, Hellenic, uh, the Hellenistic philosophers. And while it never achieves the poetic and intellectual grandeur of the Socratic synthesis, of the Platonic overarching system which makes statements about the entire human condition. Stoicism is, in fact, a noble philosophy, an excellent philosophy for silver men, for those spirited men in the Republic who are going to be our guardians. It's an excellent philosophy for military men. It's an excellent philosophy for people that are going to be practical politicians if they intend to be virtuous, if they intend to pursue the public good. And Stoicism, is characterized by a rejection of pleasure as the standard of human happiness and human felicity, Stoicism takes the position that the wise man, the good man, the philosopher, is a man who lives in accordance with nature. He fears only abdicating his moral responsibility. He is not afraid of pain. He is not afraid of death. 
He is not afraid of poverty. He is not afraid of any of the vicissitudes of the human condition. He fears only that he should let himself down and that he should be less than a complete human being. According to the Stoics, and there are a number of Stoics, two or three or four or five that actually develop the doctrine, but all the doctrines are quite similar. The only matter of concern to a wise and philosophic individual is the things completely under your control. You can't control the movements of the sun and the planets. You can't control whether a leaky ship sinks or makes it to port. You can't control the weather. You can't control other people. You can't control the society around you. There's only one thing and one thing only that you are in control of, and that is you. you, you, you. Your will, your intentions, yourself. In other words, the wise man, the truly philosophical man, is the man who is entirely in control of his own soul, who takes utter and complete moral responsibility for his actions and is indifferent to everything else, not because he doesn't care about other people, not because he doesn't care about the felicity of the entire human species, but because it's not under his control. There's no use wondering or worrying about what tomorrow will bring since tomorrow isn't under your control. Do what's right today and let tomorrow take care of itself. The Stoic philosopher is the man who has liberated himself from fear. He's not afraid of death. He's not afraid of pain. He's not afraid of other people's dismissal as a fool. The only thing he cares about is that he should meet his moral obligations. Ralph Waldo Emerson once said that greatness is the perception that virtue is enough, which is an elegant and beautiful line. And he might well have stolen that from one of the Stoics, because all of the Stoics basically, basically believe that. Virtue, moral virtue, an organized soul which pursues rationally the ends which are good for all human beings, that's the Stoic conception of virtue. They finally understand their greatness consists in the fact that they perceive that virtue is enough. We do not need wealth. We do not need sexual gratification. We do not need life itself. If moral virtue tells us that we must die in the pursuit of some good end, the protection of our family, the protection of our home, the protection of the innocent, in the doing of right, nothing should be spared, even, not even our lives. In living according to nature, what the Stoic philosopher does is examine the nature of the human condition and the nature of the world around us. He discerns his position in nature, he discerns the kind of creature that he is, and he lives in such a way as not to disgrace himself, as not to be less than what he truly could be. He won't live the swinish life that we found with Aristophanes. He wants to be, if not a god, certainly not less than human. He won't be an animal either. He will live up to the fullest potentials that human being has to offer. Now, among the Roman Stoics, two are especially noteworthy. One is Epictetus, and one is Marcus Aurelius. And one of the wonderful ironies about the history of philosophy is that Epictetus was a slave and Marcus Aurelius was a, an emperor. And philosophy is the great equalizer. Both the slave and the emperor can equally well participate in a philosophy that is accessible to all human beings as human beings. There is nothing, nothing less, so, less conscious of social status than philosophy. A wise man, a man who is disciplined in control of his motions and follows the way of nature can be a good man no matter what his position in a social structure is. He is not responsible for the social structure and it is not his problem. If the gods or nature or whatever is controlling the world makes you a slave, then be a good slave. If God or nature or whatever is controlling the world makes you an emperor, then be a good one. Your job is not to disgrace yourself and live up to the highest potentials of human being. Lord Acton, the great English philosopher and historian, once said that power corrupts, and absolute power corrupts absolutely. And that's generally speaking true. The difficulty with that generalization is Marcus Aurelius. Marcus Aurelius was an absolute ruler. He was a ruler of the Roman Empire. He was an emperor. He had absolute power of life and death over everyone in the known world. I don't mean everyone in the world as we know it today, but everyone in the world as, as the Romans would have known it. They don't know about China or have a very attenuated conception of the Eskimos. For them, the world is the Mediterranean basin, and Rome owns it. And Marcus Aurelius owns Rome, essentially. His word is law. Now, for almost all the Roman emperors, they lived scandalous lives and they disgraced themselves. They were much more concerned with indulging their sensual appetites, satisfying their passions, flying into rages. Marcus Aurelius is the standing exception to that and the exception to Lord Acton's generalization. In his case, power didn't corrupt. Absolute power did not corrupt absolutely. 
Instead, absolute power allowed us to see what the man underneath the body is really like. It allowed us to find out what Marcus Aurelius' soul is like. Imagine a man for whom all the restraints of law and custom and political order are taken away. He can have whatever he wants. If a man under those circumstances behaves well, you know something about the soul underneath because no external constraint is making him do what he, what he is doing. And Marcus Aurelius is the one example of an absolute ruler who behaves himself in such a way as not to disgrace himself. It's an amazing temptation. Imagine what it's like. Stop and put yourself in that place for a second. Marcus Aurelius takes the throne in 161 AD and he dies in 180 AD. 19 years controlling the entire world. He can have all the money in the world. That's not an exaggeration. All the money in the world. If he wants it, he can just collect it all. He can have sex with anyone he wants, whenever he wants, under any circumstances. If he wants to get drunk, he can have wine brought in by the boatload, infinitely, forever. He can go on a drunk now and stay drunk for the next 19 years until he dies. Imagine anything that the bronze, desiring, emotional, irrational parts of your souls want. And now imagine that you can have it. Now, under those circumstances, imagine that you are forced to bear with this human condition for 19 long years. Now, ask yourself, and you didn't give a show of hands, but stop and think about it for a minute. How many of you would fail to disgrace yourselves? To tell you the truth, I don't think that I could meet the challenge. If, you, if you're honest about it, and you stop and think about what kind of a man it takes to, to bear up under those circumstances, I think you'll have to admit, or at least I'll have to admit, that he's a better man than I am. And that in this respect, over the centuries, Marcus Aurelius serves as a standing repro reproach to our self-indulgence, a standing reproach to the idea that we are unable to deal with the circumstances of human life. If you can deal with temptation at that level, I cannot imagine what is outside the human potential. And for the Stoics, we must remember that any virtue which is accessible to any human being is in principle accessible to all of us. We all have a rational nature which allows us to control our feelings, control our behavior, control our connection to other people. Compared to Marcus Aurelius, we have tiny little temptations. We're tempted to steal a little thing. We're tempted to cheat on our income taxes. We're tempted to cheat on our spouses. Marcus Aurelius has that sort of temptation magnified a thousandfold. And he consistently does good stuff. Stop and think about this for a minute. This is no common man. This is not like the rest of us. And I don't know how he did it. Maybe he did it through philosophy, but, well, it remains to be seen. Marcus is the last of the good emperors. He's the last of the Antonine emperors. And the emperors that come before him are, generally speaking, okay. They're not as bad as the ones that come after. But Marcus is perhaps the greatest of the Romans, the noblest of the Romans. When old-fashioned writers talk about Roman virtue, what they have in mind is Marcus Aurelius, a man who does what he ought to do regardless of circumstance tough Roman virtue. He's not afraid of being dead. He's not afraid of being in pain. He's not afraid of having people laugh at him. He's only afraid of doing what's wrong. He's only afraid of making chaos of his soul. Why? Because his soul is the only thing he's completely in control of. It's the only thing he's responsible for. And the rest of it is a matter of indifference to him. He'll certainly try and perform his function as emperor in the best way he possibly can. But there are Germans at the border, and should they succeed in winning this war, he did the best he could. He has no reason to feel guilty. He has no reason to feel that this is a difficulty. If, for some reason, he gets sick, well, sickness is part of human life. You accept it as it is, you deal with it the best you can, and then you move on. In other words, Marcus Aurelius intends to live a life in which he will not have to feel guilty about anything. And he succeeded in doing that under the most trying possible circumstances. Again, put yourself in a position where you can have anything you want and no one can stop you. No matter how evil, no matter how depraved, no one can stop you because your word is law. Marcus Aurelius behaved himself for 19 years under those circumstances. He is in some respects an enormously lonely man and in some respects an enormously sad man. And yet, we ought not to pity Marcus Aurelius because if he looked at our lives, he would pity us pathetic creatures that we are. We don't even meet his standard of virtue, and we're pitying him. Think about the irony of that. He said, well, I'd pity you back if I didn't think that was disrespectful. Think about what it takes to be something like Marcus Aurelius. We shall not see his like again. <laughs>